Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. And class of 2014. Each day on my way to school, I pass two houses. In the front yard of one house is a child who's always screaming, shaking, and pounding on the gate to get out. It is obviously locked. In the front yard of the other house, there is a child of about the same age as the first house who always seems to be content and happy and playing with his toys. I've passed this scene many, many times. Recently, I decided to stop at each house. I went up to the screamer's door and asked the parent the reason for the child's continued discontent in behavior. Oh, she said, I just told him that I locked the gate so that he could not get out. And that upsets him, so he carries on like that. As soon as I left there, I went to that other house and asked the parent the reason for her son's gentle and calm behavior. It's simple, the mother said. I told him the gate was locked to keep the other children out. It is interesting how each parent frames the situation for their child and the children's different reaction to essentially the same condition. People's perceptions can be drastically different in any situation. I must point out to you, you have always had the power to perceive situations either favorably or unfavorably. unfavorably. I urge you to look positively on your future and the options presented to you as a view of them from behind that gate. Class of 2014, your teachers, your administrators, your families and friends have stood guard at that gate, supporting you and loving you over the last 13 years. At the conclusion of the ceremony, the gate will open. Hopefully, they will lock it behind you after you run out. <laughs> we are confident However, that you will boldly wrestle and challenge, meet success, and make good choices in your future. Congratulations and good luck. I'd like to present to you our school board president, Mr. Kevin Meisenbacher. We all stumble in life, 
we all make mistakes. To learn from those mistakes, though, is what makes us, us. How do we handle ourselves when the chips are down? How do we combat adversity? Do we throw our hands up and quit? No, no. We persevere, we overcome, we adapt, and we succeed. Always remember, there's never been a person in human history that has accomplished something great by quitting, giving up, or giving in. And the fastest way, way for you to succeed is to double your failure rate. At the end of the day, I simply don't have all the answers for you. I'll give you a hint, though. Your parents and family don't either. The only person that's responsible for your success, happiness, and failures is you. Blending others, pointing your finger, or otherwise not being honest with yourself only hurts you. It stunts your growth as a person. Accept your own shortcomings and strive to be better. It's the only way. I'll ask that you work every day of your life in preparation for your success. To each of you, will come a special moment in your life when you can tap on the shoulder to do a very special thing you need to do. What a tragedy it would be if when that moment finds you, you're unprepared for the work that would be your finest hour. If you are prepared at that hour, understand that if you truly expect to realize your dreams, you'll need to abandon the need for blanket approval. If conforming to everyone else's expectations is the number one goal, you'll have sacrificed it all. Please understand that whatever goals or opportunities that you're seeking as you leave this room today and venture into adulthood, whatever those may be, it's already inside each and every one of you. It's not in your environment, it's not based on luck, chance, or the help of others. It's in you, and it has been from the moment you were born. Marianne Williamson once said, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your point of small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't be insecure around you. We're all meant to shine as children do. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I can look back on the time spent watching all of you grow with fondness. I have a lot of memories to take with me as we leave this room today and begin the process of scattering the colleges and jobs all across this country. I remember Heather spraying my way down to the garden hose and spilling hot gravy all over her feet. I remember stepping on Kayla's head. She thought it was funny. I remember the birthday parties and smearing the cake all over my daughter's face in my kitchen. It took me more than an hour to clean up. And Sienna, where I, I think you were mostly responsible for that. <laughs> you all have memories like this, I'm sure. Little snapshot pictures that we've taken in our heads that will last us a lifetime. Pictures that make us smile. Pictures that make us happy. This is one of those moments. A snapshot is being created in everyone's head right at this very moment. <coughs> the moment when you begin the process of spreading your wings and taking on the world. Ms. Johnston, Ms. Penalton, Mr. Rocha, Mr. Montag. Mr. Hadley. And Ms. Meisenbach. It's been a wonderful journey. Thank you. To all the graduates today, I thank you for allowing me to be part of such a wonderful moment in your lives. This room is filled with love and appreciation for you. Not just for who you are and what you've accomplished, but what, for what you've allowed us all to experience with you along the way. Your families are extremely proud of you. Thank you.
Chris Kennedy graduated from Tecumseh Hills in 1990, went on to his BA from Cornell University and his PhD from Northwestern University. He's now an associate professor at Bentham University, where he teaches classes on the Revolutionary and Civil War eras, American religious history, and sports history. Chris is the author of Beyond Toleration, The Religious Origins of American Pluralism, and co-editor of The First Prejudice. Religious Tolerance and Religious Intolerance in Early America. He has written essays on politics, religion, and sports for the Atlantic, Washington Post, Philadelphia Inquirer, Inquirer, Huffington Post, and Christian Center. When he's not teaching or writing, he coaches youth sports, mainly baseball. Both Chris and his family have been a staple of the town <coughs> community for decades. And although his work has taken him away from the area, he will always be a Titan of us. Ladies and gentlemen, from the class, Scott Coast class of 1990, my friend, Dr. Chris Bennett.
from watching somebody else. And that was my buddy, Rich, who uh, graduated with me in 1990. Rich was a big guy. Uh, and he left his shirt on at the graduation party. He had no intention to take it off. He took a lot of flack for being overweight in high school. Now, uh, he didn't get as good as he got, but he was on the receiving end of a lot more mean spirited jokes that he made about others, about his eating, about his weight, about how slowly he ran. And we, we had a couple of football teams in the late 1980s. Rich was on both of them, but he only, he only played on extra points. And um, when the team was up by the 20 points, he'd be brought in. And, and uh, sometimes he'd fool around on the sideline and forget to run out with the rest of the special teams unit. And then you hear Coach Bo holler and that, that gravelly, booming voice say, Rich! You hear just all the way across the field. He may have eventually made it out there. But despite never achieving any gridiron glory, and despite getting picked on because of his weight, he stuck with that team, and he stuck with a lot of other things, too. Rich loved cars and motorcycles and doing donuts in the school parking lot in his car. He was always on the verge of killing himself one way or another. One time he connected a dust buster you know, with many vacuums to his carburetor in hopes of turbocharging his Toyota Celtic. <laughs> it, uh, it was one of many ingenious ideas he had. Flawed, but ingenious. He, he convinced our mutual friend Bubba, and in contrast to, to Rich, Bubba weighed about 80 pounds soaking wet. And he convinced them to try out this idea with him on Route 22. And so for a while, it actually worked, and me and Bubba were rocking down the road, uh, but then the car started to smoke, and uh, the experiment came to an abrupt conclusion. <laughs> and though Rich almost didn't graduate me because he skipped so many days of school, he read every book and magazine on all the mechanics and computers he could get his hands on, soaked up every good idea around him. Despite his trouble in school, he found things he was interested in, and was constantly learning about them, constantly, especially as computers. And despite graduating grades in the bottom half of our class, he started soon more still computer science and did very well there, worked hard, and his teachers noticed it. After a couple of years, he applied to the Rochester Institute of Technology and got accepted there. He paid most of his own way through college, worked nights at the computer lab, got good grades, and began hiring other people to do consulting work for him while he was in college. And just like in more still, that passion was in the guy notes. When he got out of school, Rich worked for IBM as a ground level computer guy. A few years later, left to start his own business, and he worked for Deutsche Bank, he worked for King Weather. His career path, though, wasn't straight. There were a lot of failures and rough patches along the way. Rich was fired from one job by an employer who told him that he'd like to open up an umbrella inside Rich's backside. And, and uh, Rich took it fine. He uh, did everything else, he took it in stride. When you've been made fun of since you were five, and when you've got a hundred tongue lashes, getting criticized in college or classroom or in the workplace doesn't seem like that big a deal. And it really is. There were subtle indicators along the way that Rich would do great things. When he'd come over to my house uh, during breaks from college, he'd always volunteer to make improvements on my dad's computer. He always promising to speed it up or install the latest software package like with the dust buster and the celica. <laughs> what usually happened was that the, the whole thing crashed and looked for several hours like it wasn't going to be resuscitated. And there was just no hope for it. My dad would be agitated and ticked off a bit for breaking his computer and Rich would start to perspire, look nervous, and sometimes he'd be a little apologetic. But he never got up from the computer. He just stayed there, biting his nails, tapping at the keyboard, munching tortilla chips, swigging Diet Coke, starting and restarting the computer, loading and reloading software late into the night, long after my parents had gone to bed, sometimes me too. <laughs> and when my dad woke up the next morning, the computer was humming. The hard drive was spinning faster than ever. Anyway, after college, Rich went to New York City, put in lots of hours, learned a ton, got fired, rehired, fired, rehired. Then, in 1999, there was this big, booming computer crisis called the Y2K bug. Okay, you guys have been talking about before uh, when that occurred. It was a problem in computer programming you may have heard about, and people were afraid that it was going to destroy the world because there weren't enough like, digits in the code. <laughs> and, and that was when the big money started rolling for Rich. Because financial companies, very wealthy financial companies, needed people like him to reconfigure their systems. And he was one of the few people who could manage process. Notice I didn't say that the Y2K problem made him successful. He was already doing well. The difference maker here was that he put himself in a position to do even better when the opportunity arose. 
He didn't know that lucky moment was coming. And if he's not come to college, not worked his butt off there, not shown to everyone that he's dedicated to doing every job right, then it wouldn't have been lucky for him. It would have been lucky for somebody else. Today, Rich is in charge of a multi-million dollars. He may be close to a billion dollars, I don't know. He's accurate. So I, 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 I tell I think everything tells me how to have. He's in charge of a big business group that handles technology for New York financial firms. He doesn't tell me his salary anymore, but my guess is it's, it's, it's pretty high. Enough to own a beautiful house on Long Island where he's been married nearly 20 years and two beautiful daughters. More important than the money, and I can't stress this enough, he does the work that gets him excited in the work and keeps him learning all day. And that's why he's successful. And that's not too bad for Kitchen Man, who almost didn't graduate on time and got made fun of for most of his high school career. Hmm. Now, class of 2014, before you get any big ideas, let me emphasize how Rich didn't do it. He didn't get there by buying a lottery ticket or pouring a chain email or staying up all night to be his top call of Jesus for He didn't get there by lying about the Republicans or complaining about the Democrats. He didn't get there by picking the same college major or profession that everyone else was choosing. And he sure didn't get there by quitting. What you can do is what he did. Put yourself in a position where opportunity is coming to you. Not with a big bet or some harebrained investment, but by working day and night at tasks that's valuable to other people and that you enjoy. Rich didn't have a crystal ball about the future. He didn't know where money was going to be made 10 years out of high school. But he did lie down and lashed out when he got knocked around. And he worked hard at something he loved. I'll tell you honestly, I have no idea what a great job is going to be when you come back here for your first reunion and talk about your life. Nobody does. And you may have gone through a number of jobs by the time you come back to your 20th reunion. The only certain thing is that if you don't work hard at something you love and care enough to get better at, you won't have any of those jobs. You won't be able to come back in 20 years and tell people about the cool thing you're doing. Like Richard, he was just not insufferable at every reunion. But he had the right That's it. That's the exercise in the lean protein. Forget the cool of apartheid, forget the get quick rich sheets, forget trying to pick exactly the profession you think is going to make you a fast buck. Work hard at jobs you love. When you mess something up, keep going on like until you fix it. When someone criticizes your work, don't get angry like that, don't do better. That's my buddy Rich's lesson for you. Almost all of you have more and better opportunities in front of you than he did when he sat at THS graduation in 1990. Don't waste it. Uh, let me add one more thing, and this is my last thing I said. I don't want to blame the pool party. I don't know if you guys know all that. It's evident to me that you're sitting here inside this beautiful school, not a whole lot going high school. That's where Rich, President of my rock and I all graduated from. And part of the reason we're at this spot today is a lot of people work year after year from the 1970s to the early 1980s to pass a school bill that would get this place built for you. One of them was my dad, George, and he's away fishing right now with one of his grandsons. He grew up in a farm militant and he wanted to become, I'm, I'm by far, one of the better bovine veterinarians in the state. And he wasn't born into that. He got there by hard work and grit and lots and lots of study. After getting knocked around in barns all day and having to catch him in the night, writing his bills, he spent a few moments before bed every night reading about veterinary work and how to get better at it. When I was a junior in junior high and high school, he'd come home after a 10-hour work day and then for a school board meeting where one of the big topics always was, how can we get these kids into school? Buildings that they're in now are old and they're crap, they're having a hard time hiring new teachers and we're overcrowded. Finally, after many years of toiling on this and many failed attempts, a couple years actually after my dad left the board, the district got the measure passed and a, and a new school built. So when I look at this place, I don't see just a big brick structure, a wonderful air conditioned auditorium. I see a lot of nights that my dad spent working for you guys and for me, not giving up because some people criticized him because of the money and school costs, not giving in because it's hard to get a new school built. It was required the same kind of persistence, the same kind of dedication to the community that Rich devoted to his job. There are a lot of things that I might have counseled you all about today. Be kind to others, treat them like you want to be treated, let people take lucky in, uh, lucky in terms in front of you, even if they're from the city. Don't miss your girls or weddings. Take care of your parents and grandparents. For the love of God, don't text us where you drive uh, this afternoon. The underlying message is here. Be like my buddy Rich. Learn all the times. Fix your mistakes. Never, ever connect with a dust cluster to a car. <laughs>